Well, I'm Hoople's Cat, and this is the video where I respond to the last half of the third lecture of a great course on disaster preparedness. Lecture three is all about identifying hazards. Let's pause here. I called the National Preparedness Goal a recipe. So here's a challenge for you. As you go through this course, keep a preparedness log. Start that log with a table, listing the potential hazards down the left side of the page, and then with a column for preparedness, another for mitigation, another for response, and another for recovery. For each hazard you identify, see what preparedness actions you can take in each category. You may notice that there's some overlap. For instance, the go bag I mentioned could be useful for an earthquake, a tsunami, or any other disaster requiring long-term, that is more than a few hours, evacuation of a building. So it could be listed for each hazard. Having an effective way to communicate with family is important for any and all disaster types. This overlap is good because by preparing for one type of hazard, you may also be taking steps that can help across a whole range of disaster types. Notice the phrase whole community in the wording of the National Preparedness Goal. This suggests that the community must partner with responders in shaping preparedness. One thing I would say is make really large columns and get very, very detailed, get very specific. Sweeping stuff like you use is like communications method isn't good enough. You have to actually say, I will use a cell phone. I have a spare cell phone battery here. I have a power bank charged here to use the cell phone. I will use text rather than try to call. We will, if the cell phone doesn't work, this is what you to do is to go to X and leave a message inside the microwave. Whatever it is, whatever the scenario is, you and the people you need to communicate with need to be able to communicate. More importantly, you need to be able to trust each other to be able to get together and rendezvous after any sort of a disaster, even if communications fail. The whole community concept means that it's important to know who in the community what persons or what organizations or what businesses could be there to help in an emergency. Strength in numbers is certainly something that we should absolutely definitely be encouraging for disasters, not so much for catastrophes, but for a disaster. But the thing is, you really want all of your preps that you've made to be known and taken to the local fire hall for distribution by the fire chief or the police chief in an event. I don't. Here's the point that I want to emphasize preparedness, or effective preparedness at least, requires careful planning. But it doesn't have to be and shouldn't be haphazard. Use the lessons from the National Preparedness Goal to structure how you develop your plans as we go through this course. Learn the most significant risks, which may or may not be immediately visible. Think about how you can plan for preparedness, that is, getting ready to respond. Think about mitigation, that is, reducing the damage that a disaster might bring. Think about response, that is actually taking actions when a disaster occurs. And think about recovery, that is how you would move forward afterwards. As a prepper, figure this out for yourself locally. Are there any huge piles of lumber, that are treated lumber anywhere in a warehouse or in the back of a store somewhere that people won't realistically be thinking to take early on? Can you take it? Would it be useful to you to take it? Is there risks in taking it? Those are the sort of questions you might want to ask for about wood, about gasoline, about food, about medicine, about a whole bunch of different issues. Are any of your neighbors nurses or doctors or vets or carpenters or electricians, or police officers or hunters? Think about it. Who in your local area, who in your local friend group, your local network, actually has skills that could be really, really, really useful to you and to the community at large in a disaster? Jot your ideas down after each lecture and how they relate to these categories. And you'll have taken a strong step toward being ready and being part of that secure and resilient nation that the National Preparedness Goal imagines. Answering these same questions is also, I would argue, critical for the individual. Developing a plan is great, but how do we put it into action? True this, but think outside of these boxes as well. Have you assumed that cholera and malaria cannot possibly affect you in a disaster? If so, is that a realistic assumption? Think hard about what we have now, what we could lose, and the area you live, and what similar areas are like without very expensive nation states existing there. 
let's say that you've identified the hazards in your area. And let's say that you've identified for each hazard some concrete steps you can take to plan for preparedness, mitigation, response, and recovery. Now what? Planning can't be a one-time thing. One of the worst outcomes of an emergency plan is for it to just sit on a shelf, lonely and forgotten. This is really critical. I have a winter camping bag that I use as a go bag in the winter. I have to add a few things to it to make it into a true go bag, but it's ready to go essentially in about 30 to 45 seconds if I have to, preferably at like 10 to 15 minutes lead time. But if I never use it, can I carry it? Does it have stuff in I don't need? Does it have stuff in it I need to replace because it's not of use in the conditions I'm going to use it in? What's missing in that bag? Simply put, if you don't practice and train with your equipment, you may well actually not be as prepared as you think you are. The preparedness cycle tells us what to do next. Plan, equip, train, exercise, and evaluate. The only certainty in life is death and taxes and the fact that things will change. Reevaluate your plans and preps. He says yearly, I say in spring and fall. It pretty much is an obvious time to do it for me. I have to swap in and swap out stuff because of the seasons. It's a good time to also think about my plans. Right now, because I've relocated um, miles and miles and miles away from where I normally have lived since I came to Canada, and it's out of a suburban area and out of a city area, it's very, very much rural. I have to really look at where I'm going with my plans. My plans don't really work so well are actually pointless in the new situation. So I have to really look at that. For example, a water bob sounds like a good idea. And in fact, I might go and use the water bob, but do I want to block a bathtub when I'm on a well system? There's arguments for and against it. Whereas in suburbia, in Newmarket, in Toronto, using a water bob almost immediately there was a major disaster is a really good idea. Once you have a plan, and this can range in detail from something you've just thought about to something that you have written out. One of my main reasons for making these videos is it makes me constantly reevaluate my prepping, it constantly makes me reevaluate my certainty, and it makes me reevaluate my plans. And I learn a whole bunch of really great stuff from you, the people that comment. And of course, if you don't comment, I can't learn from you. But I get a sense of community, which is kind of fake because it's virtual. But that also is a useful thing to have. However, you can get the strength to actually do prepping, emergency preparedness, use that strength and use those things to actually prep. The first question to ask is, do I need any equipment or supplies to make this plan work? <laughs> the answer is gonna be yes. Use free and secondhand gear. Buy gear and food and other stuff slowly and methodically and with thought. If you're cash limited, set up a preparedness fund. This might be as little as $5 a month. After six months, you have $30 to spend on preparedness. It's about being the turtle, not the hare. A hare can get lots of great gear and look prepared quite quickly. They can't use that gear, they haven't trained for that gear and they have bad luck. The turtle, who's been doing it slowly and prepping very slowly and methodically, may well actually be in a better position to survive an SHTF event than the hare. Let's say that your tsunami preparations include receiving a notice from your weather radio, placing your cat in a carrier, grabbing a go bag with essential supplies, and evacuating according to a prescribed evacuation route. Is all of this stuff functional and accessible to you? We have four bicycles. One of them needs a bit of repair work. I haven't done it yet, but we brought the two of them here. We'd left the two of them here for us to use and for our compadres to use. So after two years of not being used in a barn, they're in a really shoddy state. So effectively, I have a functional bicycle. I need four functional bicycles. I'm going to get them functional during this winter. I can't really particularly use bicycles in the winter here anyway, but in spring, summer and fall, they would be an absolute force multiplier to us in any sort of a disaster and certainly in a catastrophe. We also really need two functional pet carriers because I don't want to carry them in a backpack. Next, is there any training that is necessary to activate your plan or to use the supplies that you have? I know you're busy, I know you have other commitments, but this actually means physical and mental training, not watching videos or films or reading books, but actually doing things. You've got a first aid kit in your go bag, terrific. 
but have you been trained in how to deliver first aid? What a great question. Have you? Once you have a plan, even a basic plan, and you have the supplies that are needed, and you've been trained on how to put the plan into place, the next step is to do just that. Put the plan into place through practice. When did you last walk 20 miles with a pack? Secret Stuff has mentioned this a few times in his videos. There's the, uh, the pack weight, 26.2 ounces. And uh, that's what we're going to be. Well, the weather sucks. Basically, it's been raining for two or three days. I'm out walking in the rain, actually. So that really sucks. Very dreary. Uh, very dark. It's in pawn. If you have a bug out bag, have you ever carried it any distance? Do you do it regularly? When did you last chop a tree down without using a chainsaw? When did you last remove a tree from a road without using a chainsaw and a gasoline driver to pull it? Have you tried that? Do you have an hour or two spare? And you're in a forested area? Find a deadfall and pretend the road's there and see how fast and easy it is to remove the deadfall. Enough so you could, if you were in a vehicle, you could get by it without using a power winch, without using a chainsaw. Remember, if you've got a power winch and a chainsaw, things are going to be a lot easier. Assume they failed. It's always going to be situational. It's never going to be 100% certain. It's going to be a very ambiguous and frightening and transitional time. A disaster is a definite break with normalcy before we get a new normal. Normalcy bias we'll get into in future lectures is really problematic to me. But in the here and now, I know people don't have much money. I know people have busy lives. But does that stop you camping in your garden with kids? Does that stop you going on a hike for a, for a Sunday afternoon, carrying a little bag each and having the lunch in the bag? Even though it's not prepper food, sandwiches and a couple of cans actually simulates what you might go through in the early phase of a bug out walk. And you don't even have to talk about it being prepping or emergency preparedness or a bug out walk. You can make it a ton of fun. You can do the walk to try and catch some photographs of birds. You don't have to say all the time, we're bugging out today or we're going to go 10 miles that way because in an emergency, blah, blah, blah. They may not care. They may not buy into what you buy into. But they might be up to go on a hike to see some birds. They might be on a hike to go for a swim. Be creative in your training, be creative in your practice. Maybe one weekend you'll drive the evacuation route just to be familiar with it. And have backup routes that you know as well. After this cycle, planning, equipping, training, and exercising, think about what has worked well. This is really critical. If it all goes fascinatingly great and wonderful for you, you're not actually getting much out of the training practice other than false reassurance. Put in other conditions to yourself. This is easily done if it's an individual. What would you do if there was an ice storm? Everything works well for the bug out because you use the car, but say there's been an ice storm, you couldn't use the car. What would the bug out look like in this type of weather, in this type of condition for this type of event without the use of a functional car? I know other people online actually will actually tie their arm up to try one-handed fire starting. Absolutely a great idea. I recommend Bix. Now you don't have to do this every day, but it is a good idea to see if you can go through this cycle yearly, both to be familiar and to consider how it can continuously be developed and improved. Prepping never ends. There is no such thing as prepper burnout. We all have busy lives, but preparing for a disaster is a potentially life-saving activity. And fun. Check in with your local emergency management office. Kind of obvious when you think about it, eh? This could be at the town, city, county, or even state level. There are good folks who are happy to share their expertise. Preppers love to talk about prepping. Start to keep that preparedness log, which can turn into a preparedness plan. List the known hazards, and for each, consider what can be done to prepare, mitigate, respond, and recover, while also noting any special needs that individuals may have. This is particularly important if you've relocated, like we have just done, into a totally different area of the country. Don't assume no. Think about how you can apply the preparedness cycle by not only planning, but also securing necessary supplies and equipment, getting training and education on disasters and preparedness, exercising or practicing your plan, and evaluating results to consider how the plan may be modified, improved, or further developed. There are other models. Find one, use one, invent your own. 
Whatever you do, have a methodical and systematic and logical method to prepare, to train, and to evaluate both of those components for specific hazards and also for general hazards. It doesn't have to be a scenario. It can just be something like, I don't think I'm going to leave the house next week. I'm not going to leave the house for the next 24 hours. Can I survive comfortably? It doesn't have to be, there's been a nuclear war and I have to hide in the basement. It can be, but they're specifics. Think about the general stuff. Do you have enough toilet roll? Do you have enough soap powder? Do you have enough dog food? Do you have enough cat litter to sustain yourself without going to the stores for a week or two weeks or three weeks? What would be the issues? What would be the problems for you in Grid Down? Until next time, be safe. Well, that's it for me and from Wolfie, and have a great week. And next week, we start the first half of Lecture 4, which is all about making decisions. And that's not as easy nor as straightforward as you might think. And I do think you get something of value from that lecture. I definitely did. It made me reevaluate stuff. Toodles from me and Wolfie. It's been a 2021 Wolfie on the Sofa Missing His Mummy production.